Thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be part of this discussion. As, as we all can see, it's very, very important. Um, so as Yanni mentioned, I am the, on the brink of celebrating six months of owning and running a small design practice in Minneapolis with my business partner, Ross Altimer. Um, and the practice really emerged out of a series of questions uh, over the last year that we've been having about the shifts in our discipline, both our role in it as landscape architects, uh, as well as citizens with ch children facing a new paradigm. So this talk uh, will summarize rather quickly some of the complexities that we face in the United States in particular, the causes and effects um, of, of climate change and in general re resiliency. Um, and it'll summarize this through some of the projects I've worked on at various offices. So we will see um, projects from field operations, Snow Hetta, um, Tom Leader Studio, and now 10 by 10. So we all know the causes, more or less, of climate change. So the major culprits being uh, fossil fuels, uh, deforestation, um, but what about some of the smaller um, contributions? Um, things that we're doing on a daily basis in the U.S. It's a little bit more uh, different than the issues here, but we completely depend on this infrastructure of convenience. Um, systems in many ways that are, are helping us to continue an attitude about denial, about what's reasonable in, in this climate challenge world. And these habits are going to be very hard to break and uh, expensive also to invest in. Oil, energy, gas, and water, um, all of the consumption that we do on a daily basis uh, creates insane results on our landscape. So knowing your own carbon footprint in the face of all of this is really important. I think especially within the last project that we looked at, at more of a small community individual level, um, you start to understand how this all adds up to some major issues we're facing across the United States. Urbanization um, has many potential benefits we've talked a little bit about and there's been some questions about. It's why we are all here, right, in the design field, that there's a benefit for sharing natural resources, efficiency in transit, densification in lieu of sprawl, um, and in many cases I think we're pulled in a little bit too late on that conversation. So unplanned rapid growth is causing public health issues, pollution, sanitation, overcrowding, underemployment, uh, housing shortages, um, many, many things. And we're fixing these problems more than we are planning to avoid them. So the effects of all this are, are super scary. Um, weather extremes will continue to astonish and we will pay for the reconstruction by the billions. Uh, this is a photograph in New, in New Jersey. Uh, I was living in Brooklyn at the time and this is Hurricane Sandy right in the, the days aftermath of that storm. Um, that, si that storm cost New York City $19 billion um, on its own. And it has started to change the trends of the way the city is thinking about moving forward. But it, took, it takes extremes like this to inspire some of this um, reconsideration. So while one half of the United States is going to see drastic increases in precipitation and storm events, um, the other half will see a huge decrease. In the southwest U.S., um, diminished water availability will have serious consequences for commercial agriculture, wildfires, and access to clean drinking water. California is entering its fourth year of a um, record-breaking drought, creating an um, extremely parched and dangerous landscape. We are all going to get more and more uncomfortable. So it's not just about humans and how are we going to adapt to this climate change um, and temperature rise. But cows will get hot, and their milk production is going to go down. Fruit trees are going to move northward. Snow is going to melt or not exist. Uh, and seasonal tourist economies are going to disappear in some places. With this temperature rise, um, longer seasons are helping invasive plants push aside native species and completely transform ecosystems. Insects also are taking advantage of this warmer weather. So the mountain pine beetle in Colorado used to produce only one time per season, which is typical for bugs. But because of this longer warm period, they are now able to churn out a whole extra generation of bugs. So you could take a small plane and fly for an hour over Colorado and not see a single living pine tree. 
So with this shifting um, temperature and the movement of a lot of our species north, as Brian mentioned, um, for Minnesota, and we're very similar um, to Sweden in our climate and in some of our species, things like aspen and birch, balsam fir, and black spruce will largely vanish from the state by the end of the century if we stick to our current emissions. So we are effectively manipulating how species experience time. One of the questions we've been asking is how do humans adapt to these changes over time? How will we begin to understand these places and our own identity after they change and these species disappear? Um, so what will it do to our culture and to the structure, to the sensation and smell and feel of these cities and landscapes? Um, I can't imagine going canoeing in this part of the... All the trees there are, are black spruce. What is that place going to be when that's gone? You're not going to smell the moss. You're not going to smell the pine needles. I don't, I don't know how we're going to feel about that when it happens. So the projects we're going to look at um, all touch on these three themes in some way. Obsolete infrastructure. So a lot of public clients right now in the US in particular, and I'm across the globe, I think, are investing in reimagining what uh, defunct rail corridors and streets, post-industrial riverfronts, landfills, former military sites can actually become. So depending on location, typology, and politics, each project restores a different um, set of issues and attacks a different set of strategies for wildness or resiliency. This idea of post-natural, um, how we should think about urban nature in the context um, of a client, you know, climate-challenged future. Sadly, the reality for nature is, is that we can never go back. We can't restore it to exactly what it was. Soils are different, air quality is different. So we have to design to a different set of conditions that can thrive um, in these modified situations. Um, and known unknowns. Um, we can't just uh, design based on analysis. We have to be more strategic than that. So we can get the metrics, we can get the numbers, um, but we have to be willing to take risks and design for things that we might not be able to measure. So how can these parameters create opportunities for new unknown kinds of uh, public spaces and environments? So the first project we will look at is in, in Minneapolis. Um, which I was working on with Tom Leader Studio um, and KVA Architects in Boston. This uh, was a project that really started in 2009. Um, it's focused on the upper Mississippi River north of downtown, about 5.5 miles on both sides of the river. They held an international design competition and TLS and KVA won that. And it was based on an idea that parks is the, are the engine for economic development that those could knit both sides of the river together um, and therefore bring communities to the water that are completely right now isolated from that. So it turns the waterfront from a barrier to a connector. Recently, this past June, the lock in downtown Minneapolis has been de decommissioned, so there's no longer barge traffic uh, or really a reason for industry uh, north of the, the lock in Minneapolis anymore. So this is bringing to the forefront of, of discussion what those opportunities are um, in downtown for redevelopment. The Minneapolis park system is ranked one of the best in the United States. It has miles and miles of bike and pedestrian trails that link downtown to the neighborhoods and to a chain of urban lakes, which you can see in blue in the distance. But right now, the riverfront is segmented, and this is the proposal, so right now it's actually uh, got a lot of gaps in it. So this project connects and unites and pulls the neighborhoods to the water and um, connects this system. So opportunities for recreation, economic development, and habitat creation um, start to change and improve the quality of life for almost twice as many Minneapolitans. The first project that is moving forward that we are working on now, so I'm still with 10 by 10 coordinating and managing this effort um, with Tom Leader Studio out of Berkeley. So this first one is Shearer Park in Halls Island. And this neighborhood in the foreground is called Northeast Minneapolis. So Shearer Park in Halls Island will um, begin uh, environmental assessment and mass grading to establish a new uh, recreational uh, entry point to the Mississippi River for this northeast 
Minneapolis. Um, the site was a former lumber company. It is now vacant and contaminated, and you get the best view of downtown Minneapolis when you stand on this property. Uh, this diagram shows um, a historic point in time as well as the current, so you can hardly see it, but there is a, an outline below of the current um, water edge, and the diagram is showing um, over time how this island that used to be there was slowly filled in by the lumber company um, and has disappeared. Um, and to talk to some of the regulatory issues, it actually became illegal to put fill back in the river um, because it has been uh, prioritized as a shipping channel or navigation corridor. But now that that is no longer relevant, um, we're pushing hard and have sort of a grace period of the next seven years to rebuild this island in the river. One of the main reasons to do this um, is that it's this riparian habitat, which is important for turtles and migrating birds and mussels and fish that are all struggling to survive in the upper Mississippi River. This provides for that. It provides for it in an urban context where it doesn't currently exist. So the strategy behind doing this was also to extend the amount of contact that the water has with the soil, it creates a much um, better condition for biodiversity and resiliency if we can regrade how the river meets the water. And right now it's sort of this plateau uh, with a fortified edge that prevents any kind of ecology from thriving there. So this is a plan of where we left off at the end of the first phase of design. And this is where we're picking up as we move forward into extensive 2D and 3D modeling of river flows and water movement around fill so that we can make sure that the, we're not um, going to create a situation that we're washing away the mussel habitat that we create and we're not silting um, in the marina just to the south or creating any problems downstream. So the city has come to understand that they need to invest in this kind of extensive modeling in order to approve the project. So while for the first five years there actually won't be any public amenities to this park, it will be pretty much just uh, mussels and birds and letting the plants establish, we can still get in a kayak um, and paddle around and understand what a new kind of urban wildlife means in the context of the city. The next project we'll look at is in Pittsburgh, um, or the Iron City. Um, it's going to be the first phase of a new 178-acre, and I should have done my translations into um, what you would recognize how big that is. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, so the site today looks exactly like this. Um, formerly, um, it was this gigantic uh, LTV steel mill, of which Pittsburgh is known. Um, the city is gritty and industrial, and it has this amazing uh, working quality to it. Some of the buildings still have this haze of black on it. Um, but jumping back for, for a moment, what the site looks like today. Um, so in 2002, four Pennsylvania foundations formed a partnership with an economic development um, partner. They purchased the site for $10 million as a single parcel and their goal was to set up a new standard for urban riverfront development. The partners envisioned that this uh, could maximize both local and regional impact and that it should have um, sustainable sh sustainability should be at the forefront of its mission. So we've been hired to start to understand what does that mean? What are the um, energy storm, wastewater management and transportation innovations that exist in the long-term master plan and in phase one? and how do we begin to define that? So the building is 36 meters wide by 228 meters long. And our approach has been from the very beginning um, to sort of um, understand, so the top diagram on the right, to understand the efficiency in using and reusing this structure. So rather than condition this whole building, which is huge, um, we're proposing, we're working on this project, so 10 by 10 is working with MSR Architects and Dirt Studio out of Charlottesville. Um, and so we've come up with this scheme that these buildings are going to be autonomous within this structure, that the structure and the steel is actually as much a part of the landscape 
as it is a part of the architecture. Um, and it will serve as the scaffolding for the PV panels and a series of facade screens that will help to harvest daylight and mitigate get glare for the building inside. So the overall uh, design scheme has a couple primary components. What you see in yellow is highlighting the public space. So there's, um, the buildings have been organized and actually pulled away from the edge of the steel structure to create a loggia or a series of porches um, so that inside and outside, it, between the steel, between the building, between the steel and the landscape are a series of different kinds of gradients of space and that they are public. Um, so that this whole site can start to function um, uh, as a series of in-between spaces um, from architecture to landscape. So along the side of basic needs of temporary parking, the event spaces, um, we're also dealing with a huge amount of stormwater. Uh, so we're taking all of the roof water, all of the parking water, and actually an additional area surrounding the site and we've tried to figure out a way to uh, organize that into a piece of designed infrastructure that solves problems and is extremely beautiful. So we're working on this idea of a channel running this, um, this piece of infrastructure along the entire length of the building and actually pulling the channel into the building as much as possible. So the yellow you see again from the diagram is this loggia space, public space, and the channel is being pulled into that and where that happens, there will then be sort of an elevated walkway. Um, so the way that you experience that public space will, will change. We are working, of course, with the numbers and the metrics. We are working with our engineer and Atelier 10 to understand what is the baseline that the city will approve, which is not very progressive and very minimal, and um, what is the standard we are going to determine for the project. Um, for Pittsburgh, one of their most valuable resources is water. And it's one of their biggest challenges. They have aged infrastructure, and the storms are causing flash floods, sewage overflows, and are contaminating the rivers. Um, so this is a really important issue um, for us to take on. So this is a simple diagram that just starts to show how we've organized the stormwater into three distinct systems um, and how we're storing it in uh, storage tanks in order to keep this canal or channel full. Um, and where we can actually insert a living machine or black water system as part of the next phase uh, because we've been told it will not get approved right away um, if we want to reuse that water. We can put it in, but if we want it to function and reuse the water, it won't quite get approved yet. So we had to try to visualize some of this in order to convince the client what the difference is between the baseline scenario and the scenario we want to push for, which would be to handle a 100-year storm. So this is the baseline. You see a couple inputs, municipal water supply, uh, municipal sewer, storm water, all moving into the canal and how much then we are pushing out into the infiltration basin on the site. Um, this next diagram, so you kind of have to look carefully to see the difference here. Um, the next one looks at water reuse. Can we take then some of the canal water, use it back into the buildings for flushing toilets and, and the sinks? And the next one says, okay, well now let's um, uh, do a zero discharge scenario and what does that look like? We no longer depend here on the municipal sewer and the amount that we're drawing from the municipal water size, supply is, is greatly decreased. So one of the primary goals here is also to understand how people interact with these pragmatic and functional sustainable systems. Rain gardens and biofiltration ponds, they do a great job, they're very functional, but in most cases they're they sort of are separate or uh, behind the building. They're not designed as places for interaction. So this is, is a view looking at the north end of the building where we actually punch the channel into the building. We float those steel columns in that channel. Um, and this is a, a rendering showing what it might look like to have that black water living machine system in there as well. So you walk over that. It doesn't smell and it's beautiful and it makes you feel something. Um, moving through it and be able to get that close. So the question is that, you know, what if these systems are designed to serve more programmatic purposes, to be immersive and fantastic 
that can host events or art installations in different ways that can amplify the experience with different types of performance. And that can also offer programs across seasons. Um, so that we know we're able to synthesize the metrics and test design solutions for new kinds of public spaces. So the next project we'll look at is uh, the High Line in New York City. So I was working on this with field operations, Diller Scafidio, Renfro. Um, this project really captured the public's imagination and helped redefine and globally influence what green urban space can be. So it demonstrates quite powerfully how the quality um, of city space can, can utilize these obsolete infrastructures and how a project of this scale can be successfully managed by a local community. Um, there's also, to somebody's question earlier about, you know, densification or how do we shrink cities, I think this is a great example of taking an opportunity to uh, inspire some of that density. Um, you create an asset that actually draws development to it, um, and it makes life better in the process. Um, so one of the initial questions is, you know, this, it's this industrial uh, instrument of conveyance to an ab abandoned relic um, to what is it now? Um, what can it be in the future? So uh, the reason it was built, just quickly, uh, is that so many accidents were happening with the train that ran at grade. Um, there was far too many deaths each year. So the city invested in 1934 to build the structure up one story, which also allowed the trains to load and unload their cargo right inside the building. Um, this lasted until 1980. The last uh, train was full of frozen turkeys ran on the line in 1980, and then it sat uh, abandoned for over a, two decades. And an amazing volunteer landscape took over. So silt collected in the ballast, birds and wind carried seeds in, um, and this gorgeous landscape took place. So the planting adapted to the varying conditions of sun and shade and wind and moisture. And very different ecologies uh, be emerged in the different, very different micro climates. We carefully documented uh, these and mapped these in order to inform the design process. The species were all inventoried early on and formed the basis of the new planting plans that came next. So you can see here clearly how orientation and protection from the wind and the sun created zones that were much more woody and dense than exposed areas. Um, these zones highly informed and inspired the proposals that that came in the design. So I was working on this, just section one, the first 50% of the High Line, um, 10 years ago. Since then, two more sections have been built. Um, and actually, one of the interesting things is the shift in uh, the client's mind as to what were priorities when we were working on this 10 years ago to some of the things that they've done in the most recent sections. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight some of these as I go. Um, so one of the original ideas that we had coming out of the competition uh, was that we would like to retain that volunteer landscape. The photographs were so powerful and it was so wild and you felt like a lion up there. I mean, it was amazing. So how can we keep that feeling of wildness and quiet? Um, can we just design a really beautiful, simple uh, paving system to go right on top to help facilitate movement through but keep everything else? And can we do that in such a way that we create a bunch of different kinds of spatial experiences? Um, so areas where we have access, maybe where it's just about moss, areas where we encourage um, some sunken places where more water might collect and a different uh, ecology will emerge, places where we might fly over and just let the landscape be. Um, one of the other super compelling aspects of the competition, I think, um, was the idea that urban program and urban ecology could thrive in different ways in parallel. Um, the, uh, the idea that we could set in motion uh, a set of ecologies that would diversify themselves over time and adapt over time um, could run in parallel with an ability for fun events and interaction to also multiply um, and self-generate and that those two things could coexist and actually feed each other. So unfortunately, as we got into the issues up there, it became apparent that we could not keep that existing surface. 
So the area underneath the High Line is all privately owned. Um, so if it were to leak, there would be lawsuits. So uh, we had to scrape it clean, repair all of the concrete, put in a new screed layer so that drainage um, could be maximized. You get the water off fast. Uh, you never drip on another person's pr property, and um, you won't have lawsuits. So in, do in doing that, things had to change a little bit in the design concept. So the buildup of the paving plan came out of that a little bit, an open joint system um, with a uh, substructure that operates more like a pedestal system on a roof garden. Water hits it and moves through it and out very quickly, um, but that doesn't, um, that doesn't support plant life very well. So we also then found uh, the best green roof layers that we could um, to keep some amount of water up there um, to help support the plants as possible. So the plantings on the High Line are, are meant to change. This is a photograph right after installation um, in section one of one part of it. They mimic uh, the, the dynamics of a wild landscape. Plants outcompete each other, they spread or diminish in number, they'll drift to where they best fit um, and to where their individual seasonal cycles can, can um, sort of adapt. So while the landscape that thrives up there has a very wild quality, and that was the intent, it is one of the most maintained public landscapes in the United States. Um, there are, uh, I believe, 11 full-time gardeners um, maintaining, um, so for section one, that was almost one per block. Um, and their main role is to sort of facilitate and enhance the natural processes of change and the movement of these plants within the landscape. Um, and they've done extensive editing in order to maintain the integrity of the original design. Um, but occasionally a plant will volunteer itself um, and, will, and is one that will do quite well, that is native, and it will sort of populate the railway in that original wild landscape. And so um, they will let it go. So in the spirit of keeping it wild, they are also adapting how they maintain and manage um, this space. So for one example, really clear, this was in 2009 on an area called the Spur, which is not accessible to the public, and in, in 2015. It's quite a different matrix. Um, and I think this conversation brings into focus super interesting questions about maintenance and resilience for urban planting in the face of climate challenges. So the plants that thrived there were spontaneous urban plants, many of them weeds, um, or seen as weeds, but not necessarily invasive. Um, and they thrived without human intervention, irrigation, and weeding. So both with the high quality of the soil that we specified for the park, it was like crack for both the plants and the weeds. Um, so finding a better balance between, I think, what we typically design for plants in urban contexts and how more resilient, self-pioneering wildness uh, with less hand-holding uh, is very important for our public spaces, especially since most projects have the less, less capacity for maintenance uh, than this project. Section two and three were able to benefit from uh, seed collection that was done. Uh, so we didn't have that luxury of time. Things were being cleaned off, but we were able to help um, collect seeds in the later phases that were brought to the Greenbelt Native Plant Nursery in Staten Island. Um, and those were slowly grown, put back in situ, and, and helped develop the matrix for the planting plans for the next two sections. So the economics of this kind of investment into reclaiming obsolete infrastructure for new public open space is huge. So the High Line has generated more than $2 billion in private investment in the neighborhood. And given that New York City only invested 115 million or so, that's a pretty uh, impressive return. So um, the smallest project uh, we're gonna look at is with Snohetta, and it's the Urban Nest. Uh, we did this as a pro bono project. It was really to submit a small um, idea for a nest. It could be a bird, it could be a squirrel, it could be whatever animal we wanted. Um, and it was to go to um, help the Design Trust for Public Space, an auction that they do every year. So we kind of took the brief, and rather than just build one small isolated thing that could be auctioned off, 
Uh, we wanted to understand how, how it could apply to the city on a larger scale and have a bigger impact. So we looked at how to modify a typical um, building block in buildings into this sort of nest, and that maybe from the inside you could also see what was happening. There are some technical issues with this particular proposal that we won't get into, um, but I think it's the spirit of it that, that is important. Um, and also understanding that we could modify if there was a couple types so that overall the pattern on the facade was something dramatic and powerful, that we could just tweak a few um, simple things to allow different kinds of birds access in, into, the, into the nest. Um, so with that, um, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Um, Hi, thank you very much for this uh, uh, this excellent uh, speech. My pleasure. Um, I, w I have a question for the first project, mm -hmm. the, the island in Pittsburgh. River First would be Minneapolis, the island in Minneapolis, oh, oh, or the oh. mill in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the island. Um, uh, I was thinking about your th what kind of theories are you using for the biodiversity that you're going to more or less plant on this island once it's done. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, with Highline, you already, you could inventory what you had there, uh, but you can't do that approach for the island, right? Uh, not exactly. I mean, we have gone back and we have, we have looked at um, sort of the <laughs> ecological layers of that part of the city back in time. But again, to the point of how relevant is that now? We can't just replace that kind of landscape because this is a different soil, it's a different environment. Um, it's a different climate. Um, the urbanization around the edges are, propo are posing different conditions. So um, we know what is native to the area and what thrives um, in this region. Um, and we, since we're recreating a riparian habitat, you know, we have a, a list of species that you know, can be sustained in this kind of water saturation and these kinds of grades, in this kind of flux of the, the height of the river. Um, so we're really building the species based on th those sets of um, layers of mapping and information. Uh, you mentioned you had uh, the city invested $115 million mm -hmm. approximately into the High Line, and that gave in turn uh, $2 billion approximately. Yeah. What, do you have any examples from what kind of private investments were made? Sure. Um, well, so the, the investment is really talking about all of the new, probably luxury high-rise high buildings around it, um, many of them also um, pretty high-profile architects. Um, so there was a bunch of sort of vacant lots right along the High Line. Most of those have all sort of been built out. It's also the two blocks from the train, the train on 7th Avenue. It's all sorts of development just filling in around this meatpacking district. Part of it, I think, is just the energy of that district and the city, as in many cities across the country, you know, the meatpacking old industrial parts of it are becoming trendy. Um, but it is also in part that, that the investment into this public space and how beautiful it is has inspired people to want to live on it, walk it every day with their dogs. Um, so mostly residential towers, I would say. 